All right, everybody, we are at 6 o'clock. Wow, that's loud. Can you see me, Donnie? Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Can everybody at the Paper Moon hear me? Holy cow, that's, that's loud. Thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. It is a gorgeous night, but we've got a great crowd. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you spending your Thursday night with us. This, of course, is uh, the Revit UV RVA user group. My name is Jason Kunkel. I'm with CAD Microsystems. We are an Autodesk partner, and we sponsor this user group and three others uh, generally in the area. We've got Richmond, we've got D.C., we've got Baltimore, and we have Raleigh now as well. So if you ever find yourselves in one of those locations and you really, really want to go and learn more about Revit and get some free food, um, come on over. We're more than happy to have you join us. Um, so the user group, our concept behind here, we've, we've got a board. Um, where are my board members? Board members, raise your hand for me, please. Awesome. Um, we meet uh, every other month to kind of decide on topics. We, we populate ideas. We get ideas from you guys. There will be a survey after the meeting, so if you have any thoughts on topics you would like to see or any improvements at all that you would like to see, please send those to our way because uh, that's where we get our, our topics for the next presentations from, from, from you all. Um, building community, educating, that's, that's kind of the whole plan here. For tonight, um, what we've got kicking off with is me. You have to listen to my nasally voice for about 15 minutes. I'll be doing kind of a crash course on Revit 2020, which launched yesterday, even though some of us are still having trouble downloading it at this point. Um, after that, we've got Colin and Langdon from DPR, who are going to be doing kind of a demonstration, a talk on using BIM 360 for design and construction. And then we're going to follow that up with just kind of a panel conversation on BIM 360 and, and how it gets used there as well. Tacking onto that, before we kind of get rolling, you see the camera, you see the microphone. Um, we are working our way through a bit of a science experiment. We're trying to record these. We're also trying to live stream our user groups. So I don't know if you guys were aware of this, um, but we're trying to get a little momentum and see the value and understand the benefits and how those could work. Uh, if, if you are willing to do so, if you would, would like to help out, feel free to navigate over to YouTube right now um, search for CAD Microsystems. That's our big, uh, our big blue and orange there. And just go ahead and click on that live link just so we can kind of pump up those numbers a little bit. It's a little, uh, you know, a little immodest request, but uh, it would certainly help out and we can kind of test and see how this thing goes. So um, with that, I think that covers all the upfront stuff. We're going to go ahead and get rolling now. Um, like I mentioned, our first 15 minutes or so of the presentation, it's going to be on Revit 2020. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get things kicked off. And how did, how did that get in there? I don't, I don't understand this at all. This is really, it's really weird. Um, so I'm trying something new with this presentation. I've got 15 minutes, like about 30 odd slides in here. I have set my slides on a timer. So I've got a lot of topics I want to get through. We're going to try to get through them. I'd like to kick things off with uh, first getting everybody up to date on the Revit 2019.x releases. So if the last time you looked at new features was about a year ago, you've missed two releases since then. First thing I want to talk about in 2019.x, um, the home cloud browser. So they changed the home page. So as soon as you get into Revit, used to be that gray stripe, gray stripe. New look, easier to use. Um, doesn't mess up when you try to open a central model. It'll allow to automatically create a local file for you. Uh, you can automatically and quickly get into your BIM 360 projects right from the home page, and just a lot more streamlined, easier to use, and a little easier to understand what you're trying to get to. Site collaboration with Civil 3D. So your Civil 3D users, um, we got one in the back, can publish their model up to your BIM 360 project, and then you can link that Civil 3D publish file in, and it will generate and be a Revit topo for you at that point. Um, they added a couple features throughout the year. One was to host elements, spot elevations, building pads added as well. Another addition is IFC linking. So the Autodesk desktop connector has been improving and improving and improving over the years. Uh, if you didn't know, you can now bring in and access things like your image files and link in DWGs and link your shared parameters files from your BIM 360 project. Recently, they, they also include the ability to link in IFC files directly from that BIM 360 cloud location as well. 
<clears throat> kind of a little one, but something we've been looking at for a long time. You can use your paint bucket on top of a wall of the material. If it's a model pattern, you can do everything you can do with model patterns like normal. Uh, select it, rotate it, align it. Just a little more visual fidelity when it comes to your modeling. Um, kind of seals up the, the top of the walls there. And, and again, it's one of those things that, that kind, of is, kind of is the icing on the cake there. Um, import double fill patterns. If you have to import your DWGs, we do not recommend you import your DWGs, but if you do import your DWGs, Revit will now support double um, patterns. So 2018 or 2019, Revit inherently allowed for background and foreground patterns, and that has been expanded into any sort of imported and exploded DWG file. Perspective views uh, have got some tweaks. So they went to the tabular layout inside of 2019. You were able to toggle between ISO and perspective in 2019. Throughout the year, they kind of refined that. They added um, orient to view with section boxes. They fixed the zooming and the panning. Whoa, that was a pop. The, the uh, zooming and the panning. So just a lot of little nudges throughout the year to make kind of working in 3D and designing in 3D a little more intuitive, a little easier, and just make it part of your design process. Section view aligning. Um, before when we needed to get our section cuts kind of lined up with an angle there, you kind of had to eyeball it, right? You kind of had to get it really close and, and feel how it is. There is now, you can use your align tool to align your section cut line with an existing model line inside of your model. There's also snapping right to the line or, or snapping with the line. Um, just kind of gets that cut where you want that cut to go. Cloud models inside of Revit. So we've had design collaboration for years and years and years, and that allows you to take a work shared model, save it up to BIM 360, and allow multiple people to work on it. With this addition inside, I think it was 2019.2, you can take a non-work shared model and also publish that up to BIM 360. Makes in this format, it's kind of a streamable format, so it's a little faster and a little easier to use. So if you don't need a dozen people working on your model and you want to leverage all the benefits of a BIM 360 project, you can now use that. I like this one. Hold down your control button and do your wheel mouse up and down. You can zoom in and out. It's very helpful for some of us who are getting very close to needing reading glasses and things like that. So it's a little thing, um, but it is a huge plus. Obviously, this does not impact your, your printed schedules at all. Those are just the working view of your schedule. Um, but again, makes it a little easier. Multiple instances of images. They've added a new button on the Manage Image dialog box. In the past, you had to select an image, copy your clipboard, and paste it in the location if you wanted another instance of that image there. Uh, now you go to Manage Images, you select the image, and there is a Place Image or Place Instance button right there. So you just navigate to your view, select the image, click Place Instance, and it will be placed where you need it to go. <sighs> My timing is not perfect. Uh, move objects small distances. I'm sure everybody has seen the distances too short. I will not move that. Revit says no. Revit used to want things to be at least 1 32nd of an inch. Uh, they've removed that now. So if you do need to move something 1 256th of an inch, you don't have to move it 1 foot 1 256th and then move it back a foot like we always used to. You can just move it 1 256th of an inch. Um, hopefully you're not having to design everything to the 1 256th of an inch. Revit 2020, these are my 2020 new features. I am, have an architectural background. My apologies to the structural and the MEP folks. I have notes about what your new features are and I'm going to be reading those. Hopefully you think they're great. InfoSender's got a tweak. They got rid of the um, little satellite dish and the star. That was actually a Windows service program, WS Com Center 4, that's gone. So if you ever had troubleshooting problems there, that's gone. By default, the um, search is compressed. So a little cleanup, a little refinement there on our title bar. You know, just a little nice little little nudge and, and kind of removing some clutter. Last version of SketchUp that Revit used to support was SketchUp 8. Uh, it now supports bringing in SketchUp 2018 models, and it will bring in the materials and the colors on those models as well. So more fidelity as it's pulling those models in if you need to use uh, SketchUp. And that's all I'm going to say about SketchUp at this time. Getting a breath. Dynamo 2.1 is shipping with Revit 2020. If you're using Dynamo, if you're trying to manage Dynamo, your scripts, your DYN files, there was always that. What version of Dynamo do you have? What version of Revit do you have? They never lined up. With 2020, they are now lining up. Dynamo comes baked into Revit, and every time you need Dynamo updated, you're going to update Revit. 
So it's not really Dynamo 2 whatever anymore, it's Dynamo 2020. One of the nice things though, it's more quarantined, so you don't have to worry about this Dynamo fighting with other Dynamos. Copy-paste legend across sheets. So legends are one of those views that can go on multiple sheets. And in the past, we always had to um, click, a sheet and or click a sheet and drag that legend view on. Now you can select legend, you get it where you want, copy to clipboard, you go to another sheet, and you paste from clipboard in the same location, it's going to be right there where you want it. Uh, obviously, this just kind of helps getting our sheets lined up right, which has always been a little bit of a challenge inside of Revit. Scope boxes are now a parameter you can list on your schedules. So if you have a view list, you can add scope box there, you can change the scope box, you can modify it, and it's just way easier, obviously, to get a whole bunch of views at once. I'm your, you're on scope box A, you're on scope box B, and then, of course, it will constrain your crop region down to that scope box and do everything that a scope box is going to do inside of that list. One of the architectural features that got added, we now can draw walls with the ellipse tool or the partial ellipse tool. It works kind of like you'd expect it to work. Looks like work like arcs, um, joins, cleanup, doors, windows, everything plugs in the way you'd expect it to. Uh, it's just one of those added little plugs that's in there. Oh, this is my first. The next one's the structural guys. All right. Got to get ready. I got my notes. Structural folks have to tell me if it's any good or not. Okay. Shape-driven rebars now snap more intuitively to the concrete cover when you copy or move them. Shape-driven rebar segments are now automatically constrained only to the concrete host faces that are in range of each segment. Standard bars now snap to stirrups automatically only if the standard bars passes through the stirrups. Is that anything? Is that, is, is that, I mean, there's a lot of pictures of rebar in here. I'm just gonna warn you. They, they love rebar during this, this release. Uh, hey, look, it's more rebar. Um, Multi-rebar annotations can be used to dimension free-form rebar sets with planar and parallel bars at any view that is perpendicular to all the bar planes of the bars in set. <laughs> is, that, is that what we're getting there? This, this, is, this is the response. It's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I cannot speak intelligently to this. Um, anyway, uh, rebar inside of modeled in place stair category elements. So this is not your regular stair tool. This is model and place elements that are in the stair category. And now you can um, create uh, rebar and put your stairs. And, and if you've got to build your stairs from scratch like this, which every so often you just have to, sometimes the stair tool is not going to do it. Now you can get some rebar in there. So I told you, a lot of rebar. Uh, next one is steel connections propagation. And there is a right click now on the steel connections. And for propagate connections, so instead of, I guess, manually applying the connection uh, everywhere, you kind of right-click on it, you say propagate, and it will push itself out to connections that match up with the one that you've already selected. So it seems like it might be a nice little time saver. Yeah, save a couple seconds there. <coughs> Sorry. Structural stuff is not my forte, obviously. Just wait till I confuse you on the MEP stuff. Uh, some new parameters for your steel components. There are parameters for, uh, I don't have the list here, plate width and length. You can tag them, you can schedule them. I'm assuming you can filter by them as well. I did not get in there and test it, but most new parameters that we've seen in this release and prior releases, taggable, schedulable, filterable, um, whatever you need to do with those schedules there. I can now put my PDFs in Revit. Works like an image. Um, it actually rasterizes it, so you've got to give a DPI, but the vector data is there. I can select lines, I can snap to lines, uh, 2D only. If I have multi-page, it gives me all the pages, I select the page I want and it puts it in. But like I said, um, works a lot like an image, so if you've got previous details, if you've got UL details, if you've got old drawings, you don't have to make them a PNG anymore and link them in, you can just directly bring them in this way. <coughs> The filter rules have really gotten some nice improvements over the last couple of years. Just graphically, it's easier to understand. In previous versions, if you had an OR rule, which means any of those rules can be true, and you went with different categories, whatever parameter you're checking had to be in all of those categories. Now it doesn't matter. Now I can have a parameter in my walls and um, have an OR rule with a parameter that is in my windows. It does not have to be the same parameter anymore. Oh, here's some electrical stuff. Um, three main areas of improvement for home run wiring improvements. User-definable home run arrow styles, 
multi-circuit home run arrow control, and additional option for wiring tick marks. It's my electrical guys. We thinking thumbs up? Okay, hasn't played with it yet. Um, we're thinking thumbs up. Come on in, you're good. Um, the next one is coming up, change service improvement. So selections, uh, fabrication ductwork to allow selection service to be swapped while giving the user the ability to retain its original shape. Where's my, uh, where's my mechanical guys? Are we thinking thumbs up? Yeah? Yeah. It's a nice picture. I like the picture a lot. Um, so for my electrical guy, I was told that I'd be showered with praise and flowers and a standing ovation just by saying the word lug. So, okay, this, my consultants tell me this is huge. Tell me like this has been waited for for a long time and uh, this is a game changer. And so this is a, this is a pretty exciting one. Um, yeah, not limited in your panel schedules really to just the 41 or whatever. You can keep expanding and doing what you need to do for your lug connections. Some new parameters. This is our next to last one. Offset is renamed offset from host. Elevation from level has been added or it's been renamed from elevation. I would strongly recommend reading the help file. There's different rules about when that is directly updatable. There's different rules about what categories this goes with. There's different rules about what type of host it is and where you're hosting it. If I've got the same type of element, it's hosted vertical versus horizontal, I get different control there. But this is now a built-in parameter that I can filter, I can tag, and I can schedule. So it's just to make things consistent. Last one, path of travel. I can now click on point A and point B and Revit is going to draw the shortest line between those two points for me. That is taggable, that is schedulable. I can change what it looks like. It is filterable. Um, you can ignore certain categories, but it is all model elements that it's looking for. So if you just draft stuff, it's just gonna walk right over top of it. Currently it is only single level, so it's not from second floor down to first floor, so we've got some work to do on there, uh, but it's still a pretty exciting thing. That's our list. That's my 15 minutes. If you have any questions, please feel free to come find me after the user group. Hopefully you're excited. We like some of these features and uh, we're looking forward to, to implementing. said they were doing a project in, in the Richmond area, I think VR was, and that they were using this for his thinking. I said, boy, it'd be great if you could show us what's working, what's not working, how you're using this tool on, on your project. And he said, great, I, I, I'm all set for the presentation. And then about two weeks ago, he said, hey, I'm not able to make it. I got Colin and Mike to do, to do it for you. So you guys got, got, got the short straws that would happen? Yep. yep. <laughs> okay, so they're here tonight to uh, present to you on, on, on 360 Classic and Next Gen, if you're not aware of it, you'll see the differences, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, have the different presentation, we'll have some questions for the panel, uh, you know, we put together and kind of talk about the issues that people are having and questions you might have, and, and uh, yeah, so uh, why don't you go right ahead, Colin. Okay, okay. Uh, my, my name is Colin Fish. Fish. Uh, no. All right. All right. Uh, so for BIM 360, this was kind of introduced me for the first time for the project that we're using this on, uh, a large healthcare project in downtown Richmond. And it was pitched as a, a tool that could really be used by everyone for not only you know, combining files on Revit, collaborating on files uh, for construction, but tracking progress, basically being your all-inclusive place to uh, host documents, uh, check on progress, have it be your home page uh, as a visual for people outside of the project, really being a tool for subcontractors to use, uh, and really being kind of your one-stop shop to uh, have a spot for these people to go. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of dive into it. 
Uh, we've got a little presentation here. Maybe. So, uh, next gen versus classics. Uh, the BIM 360 modules have been around for a while, uh, and BIM 360 is kind of a, a term that's been thrown around as just Autodesk's version of collaborative tools. And they've gotten to the point where they're now starting to combine some of these tools into places where they will work really well with each other. And that's kind of just, that's basically what next gen means, is it's, it's not a huge change in the actual tools themselves, and more of a change of how those tools interact with each other. So document management. Uh, I'm gonna go back to where we were. So document management here is broken up into two pieces. We've got plans and we've got uh, documents. So plans is a great tool for using drawings. The issue with plans, or some of the issues we're running into with plans is that it doesn't necessarily handle specifications very well because it takes those drawing issuances and immediately dumps them out into, so if I get one drawing file that has 30 sheets, it's gonna split all those up into individual sheets. So if I get a drawing package that has an 800 page spec book attached to it, it's gonna split all 800 of those sheets into individual pieces. Uh, so that's one of the issues we were running into with this. Um, diving in a little more deep with plans, on our project we've uh, started, it's a design build but not quite a design build. So we've had to figure out ways to keep the team updated with the design, but also keep those models and those drawings not necessarily in, on the leading construction edge of the project in that subcontractors are really only working off of one package inside this plans. So whenever something gets updated, people need to update their pricing, things like that, uh, that all happens in this issued drawings package. And that gives us a chance uh, as a contractor to review those, provide feedback, uh, update our overall price for the project, and then move that on to a construction documents folder. And it kind of has that flow of uh, not just being dumped out in the open for everybody to see, but kind of passing through down the line. Uh, this progress print side is not necessarily something that they're issuing as a package, but just something that's being updated on a regular basis. So every Friday, they'll dump in their latest and greatest in here, and everyone can be working off of seeing what that latest and greatest package is. So some of the document workflows here. Uh, a big thing about BIM 360 is permissions and uh, their permissions are uh, really intricate. So you can split up permissions not just by person, but you can assign permissions by uh, company and role, which really allows you to, instead of adding, whenever you get a new person on the project, instead of just adding them you know, to every single folder they need to be a part of, if they're added to the right company, as soon as they're added into the project, they're automatically added to all the right files that they need to be a part of, that they need to be collaborating on, which has been really useful um, on this project. And then within that company, you can also set up, okay, I have uh, superintendents, I have uh, project managers, I have different kinds of people within that project that also might not want to see every single file on the project, but they just need to see certain things. So it's also allowed us to even break it down farther into those subcategories. Um, so here, the way we have it split up is we have it, we're still kind of ironing out how these folder structures are going to work, uh, but the main thing here is we have uh, five categories here under our documents. The owner files is kind of the primary contractors, us, the designers, the owner, uh, and that's our way of getting into uh, just things that we want to keep kind of internal to the design team and the design assist partners. And from there, we would get into shared files. This is everything pretty much having to do with construction. So going into stuff that's happening on site, submittals, RFIs, things that everybody needs to be a part of and everybody needs to be able to see and collaborate on. Uh, from here, we get into uh, VDC. So this is where all of our team models are hosted, broken out by company, right? Uh, we also have any kind of documents that go along with VDC, any kind of reports, uh, clash reports, things like that, are going to go in this folder. 
Uh, we have a folder for our subcontractors to transfer files up to us, and that keeps us from having to uh, have the subcontractors email us and then us uploading it. It's saving that extra two steps in the middle of that process where they're uploading it right to here, and it's just a quick move into the right folder where it needs to be. The architects and engineers can review those submittals directly from that file. So they could go in here to the sub-file transfer, and as soon as we've notified them a submittal is ready for review, they can take it and actually go in here, grab the file, and there's an approval process that I don't quite have set up yet, but there's an approval process where you can say, this is assigned to these three people, that person checks it, yep, good, that person checks it, good, that person checks it, and then it goes, says completed, it can be returned right to the sub, all in the same spot. So that's something I'm really looking forward to using. Uh, have played with a little bit, but we haven't obviously had a, had a chance to set that up yet. Um, some of the other things in BIM 360 uh, from a overall standpoint. You've got oh, project home page that will load. And this will give you kind of a, a landing page for other people on the project, maybe people that aren't necessarily involved in the project every day, but want to get a snapshot of where are we trending as far as submittals, RFIs. You can pull in information here from other uh, resources. So we use uh, Power BI a lot with our programs, and you can pull in any module from Power BI and have it show up here, show a graph, show a scale, um, anything like that. We'll also end up having a lot of camera views of the project shown on this page. So a really neat spot to just get a kind of, if you were an outside person looking in, this is kind of how the project is running, status of the project. Uh, design collaboration. So this piece is going to be a really useful tool uh, on this project in that the way the models are published is that when the design team pulls together a model, so let's say they pull together that model and they say, all right, we're ready to issue it. It then gets sent out. It becomes a little dot on this line. So it get, serves as that place and time. And then subcontractors, uh, contractors alike have to go in, grab that file, and it moves to a consumed folder, acknowledging the fact that they've seen the file, they're adding it into their model, they're incorporating those changes, whatever was made. Uh, and this will give a nice timeline across. Uh, here you can have multiple companies set up on this side to set up for that, uh, that collaboration portion. So those are really the big parts. Uh, I'm not going to go into field management too much, uh, but those are the big parts that we're going to be using on this project as far as uh, BIM 360 from a document management and project management standpoint. Center in, okay. Thanks. So it's a major data center that we have going on right now with RVA. Um, so a lot of you may be using BIM 360 Glue currently. Um, so I'm just going to go through our general workflow process that we're currently using for this project. Um, so this is a general Navis file that we have everyone's model uh, merged and appended into. Um, we're using a, a naming. Oh, let me turn this on. We're using a naming convention for each one of those models that uh, we've established in our VDC execution plan. Um, so all of those are dependent based on whatever they are representative of, and they're coming from those subcontractors. Um, we're using BIM 360 Glue to combine all of those files together and basically have just a, a general jump point for everyone to come into and merge their models in. 
Um, so all of that is being done. Uh, most of them are using Revit to use all of that. So if they have a general Revit file, they're just coming up to their add-ins folder and then going over to Glue. And it's a direct connection to BIM 360 Glue. Um, from there, they can easily jump in and select which folder that they want to use, depending on where they're at or which uh, server that they want to jump into, in order to upload their files so that they can quickly and easily get any kind of additions, changes, uh, anything that they might be adding in based on others' models uh, directly to the, the Glue platform. Um, from there, Navis is just a quick refresh, uh, and everyone can see what everyone else is working on using uh, the BIM 360 Glue. Uh, in addition, we're also using uh, BIMTRACK. Uh, so BIMTRACK is how we're tracking all of our issues, RFIs, changes, uh, anything that's happening from these models that are being appended and merged together. Um, all of this uh, information is going into one location, so it makes it much easier for us to collaborate and work together for any kind of edits or problems that we may come across over the course of coordination. So does anybody have uh, any questions about either one of these two workflows we've kind of shown here this evening? Or? No, we're using uh, Glue just to house the, the different models from all of our different subcontractors. Um, so from there, we're using Navisworks to append and merge them all together. Does Glue do that? Uh, yes. Yes, it does. It, it does it without Navisworks, but we're using Navisworks because it's a better, uh, we found that it's a better platform for uh, putting all of them together, and then we can use the BIM track software. So that's really been the main benefit, as well as the clash detection uh, that we get out of that. So we're really in encouraging our uh, subcontractors to do a lot of their own clashing um, and, and make sure that they've got their issues as much as they can determine and fix for themselves before they actually come into these coordination meetings. Um, so that hopefully BIM track is really just being utilized for issues and problems that, uh, that they can't solve themselves. So uh, BIMTRAC is an online software that uh, we can easily go into and set up different issues, create an issue based on a different viewpoint inside of Navisworks um, or even Revit itself. Um, this has a, an add-in for Revit as well. Um, from there, you can easily pull up any kind of issue that someone has potentially made. So I can say, hey, let's go view this in the model. Um, then I can spin around and take a look and see what it potentially is. What is our problem here? So we can see this one, we've got a framing tube that's running right down through our duct opening. So then I can, from there, bring up uh, the edit on it. So that ticket can come up and tell me specifically what someone may have had an issue with. So you can see one of our subcontractors here has put in a note that we can then talk back and forth or I can add in uh, a new status to it. If I fixed it and re-uploaded it to Glue, I can change my statuses over to finished or uh, ready for review or whatever the case may be so that when we go for coordination, uh, our VDC managers can go in and make sure that that's been taken care of. Um, so all of this is going into Power BI as well so that we can keep track of all of it and make sure that we're, we're trending in the right direction. Uh, and making sure that we're getting these tickets closed and uh, coordination is proceeding in the right fashion. Is there anything else? No? Sure. So everybody else says this is all of our other subcontractors that are currently in the model. So you can see we've got a, a file folder structure that we've set up in our VDC execution plan that goes through for our design models, anything that we've archived up at this point. Um, and then it just breaks down from there. So electrical, mechanical, civil, it's just kind of broken out by each one of our different subs. So DWFs, uh, NWCs, we encourage NWCs for them to post up. It's obviously a lot easier for us to push into Navisworks from there. 
Um, we also have a box folder that we use where we ask everyone to post Revit files if we can. Um, that way it just makes it easier for each one of our different subcontractors, whoever, to, to pull in those Revit files and make sure that they're not just utilizing Revit, doing the transform, and then having to go back and forth and back and forth. Uh, if we can get a link of the most updated one, it makes it much easier. So then these are the files that you're back Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're using Glue as the, the most up-to-date live version. Mm -hmm. Any questions for the audience? Oh, the sure. World. Sure. So if you need to update a DWF, so if you were to update any of these files, um, Navisworks, when we have it open, will tell you that a newer version of the model is available and that you need to go ahead and refresh. It'll give you a little, uh, you know, a little exclamation down in the bottom corner. So. No, we don't need to save any. It's all being saved right here for the NWCs. We, we keep a backup of all of these on our box folder um, just so that we make sure that we've got everything in its a backup location just in case. So the reason we have them put them in the uh, box folder rather than here is so that we just have the NWCs and DWFs that we're going to be merging to Navisworks coming out of here. Uh, anything that's in the box folder is more for just our subcontractor teams uh, to use as their link. And uh, the majority of the time what we found, depending on the uh, level of use from each one of the subcontractors, if you have different groups that are using C4R, you have others that are just doing their own centralized server locations for their centrals, uh, they're either linking directly to those box folders and pulling those in, uh, or they're copying, copying them out to their own C4R and then uploading them for their team's use. Uh, so as soon as that does happen and that they see there's a newer model version on Glue, it's a good indication that potentially there should be an updated version of the Revit model. So that would be where they would go then look for that and that way they can get that update. Um, using that BIM track, you know, those are some of the issues that potentially could go out that would be immediate to go to those subcontractors to let them know, hey, we need an update or there is an update that's going on. So BIMTrack has been a really great tool for us. I mean, just to be able to talk to all of our subcontractors and be able to put those questions out there and get those answered quickly. Um, we've even started using it for a lot of our RFIs as well so that our design team has something that they can quickly and easily go to uh, and look over and then start tracking the whole process through. That's all I had. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so we are uh, actively scanning right now out on site. So we do a couple of different scans over the life cycle of the, um, of the install. So obviously we put out our control points and then we go back in for our first pass to do a scan of each individual. Depending on, we're really trying to do it at, at precise, you know, steps in the process, right before we close in the walls, right before, you know, when we have the first layer of uh, MEP that goes up, and then coming back for a final pass, everything has been finalized. Uh, from those point clouds, we're actually going back in now and producing as-builts um, from those point clouds, so we're checking that against the latest signed-off coordinated model. So that's where all that's being housed at. group. Okay. Do you have anything you wanted to add? I can. Okay. That's, yeah, that's all I had. Yeah. Pretty straightforward.
Right. The project so still started. started. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. So you're just kicking off that project. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. So we're trying to go through right now just all of the kind of putting together of what process are we going to use, like that uh, submittal process I talked about. That was a big thing for the architect because, you know, people like to control the way that process goes. And it was very key to them to be able to see sort of timestamps and everything. When was this? not necessarily moving around in that process. It's it's just a little, you know, that's when it was uploaded. That's when it was, you know, official. Oops, for the crowd, for the crowd around the planet. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. For uh, submittals, uh, one of the big things that the architect wanted to see was, you know, timestamps to everything that was happening. And so a big thing for them was just being able to see when was the file uploaded, when was it officially submitted to the architect, when was it reviewed by each individual reviewer? What were the comments that were posted on that RFI, or sorry, submittal? And kind of how that was being tracked through the process, because most people are used to using their own in-house software. A lot of companies use their own in-house software. And it was very uncomfortable to propose a lot of the things that we were proposing, because it was getting out of that comfort zone of having everything under your control, under your software, uh, those sorts of things. So when you're making revisions and comments on the, the submittals, um, are, do they have, does, does the BIM 360 platform allow you to have the similar markup tools that you would have in some of the in-house softwares or, you know? So a piece, of that, a piece of that that I forgot to mention was part of that submittal review would be opening up a Bluebeam review session. Uh, and that, that was how a lot of that stuff was getting tracked. Because Bluebeam review, as most of you know, is fantastic at tracking a lot of those comments and markup tools and things like that. Okay, excellent. excellent. <laughs> did, did that answer your question? Okay. That is able to be opened. You can open up a Bluebeam review session directly from BIM 360. Oh, that's, that's useful to know. Save it back. Yeah. At the end, it, it pulls it all back in. Excellent. Excellent. So you, you, you all have really just, ju just begun using the next gen tool on a project and have been using the classic tools. So, so, so can, you, can you talk about that line bit about what are the classic tools really you guys like use the most? Uh, Which are indisputable, they, hey, almost every project you're using these tools. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say glue. I mean, more than anything, we're, yeah, I mean, glue is the, yeah, it's just the way we've got it set up. I mean, we're really just using it as a platform to, to be able to have everybody post everything too, so that we've got one central location that we're merging it all into. And then, and then that same philosophy is going to carry through a next gen, adding on more functionality mm -hmm. and, pr and, and defining the workflows longer through the project, rather than just in the coordination slot. Right. Yeah. And we've we've just started using plan and field as well. So I mean, we're utilizing a lot of that for our QC and any of our field work at currently. So. I mean, we're just starting to break into all of that and really figure out the best ways that we can utilize it for each project. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I mean, it's 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 a um, it's it's obviously it's Autodesk concept of how this data is going to, you know, stay in the workflow process through design to construction to fabrication to the to the building owner. And we're really at the you know on page five of a 300-page book, in my opinion. We're just getting started. So thank you guys for presenting all you know where you are right now. And I'd like to invite you back in a year. Right, right. Come back and, 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 and tell us how it went and what went wrong, what went right, because uh, it seems to me like, you know, on projects, there's, you know, somebody's got Dropbox here, a box here. There's, there's data everywhere for each individual, you know, kind of group or process. And this sounds, seems like it's a concept that works, but it's, like you said, it's hard to get people to change and say, hey, this is how we're doing it. So, so Chris, from your perspective, do you, do you get any, or from, I, I'm curious, you and Greg, do you guys get any value out of using a BIM 360 tool like this, like, or, or not? In, in terms of glue and tracking issues, that sort of thing, um, probably. We haven't come across a project yet where we've leveraged that. Um, I think the advantage that the project that was shown was more about uh, a design build project where the team, right from the get go, is sitting at the, pr at the table instead of um, a design, bid, build type setup where we're still kind of siloed in that, in that setup. So 
uh, in that regard, yeah, it would be fun to fun to jump in and, and work that way. Right. So, Barry, do you have any yeah, I mean, I think as a consultant, we see a lot of the back end of of the site in the sense that we're not managing it. For those who don't know, Greg, structural, structural right? And so, I mean, as a collaboration tool, it's extremely helpful. It's extremely helpful to have the document management part so that when the MEP sends us all their equipment sizes, they can dump them in their folder. They're there for forever. If they want to update them, we'll get a notice when they update it. Um, and so that part of it is just a great opportunity for us to stay on top of that side of things. When it comes to all the during construction and the setup of it, you know, we aren't typically involved in that aspect of it. But are there emails that are generated every time, say, the mechanical engineer uh, updates one of the PDFs for the equipment stuff? Yeah, easier to reach, right? Yeah. Uh, they can be. So you can set up notifications for any folder or any individual file, like uh, we were saying a second ago. Uh, so you can have notifications whenever anything is updated. And it will actually keep a version of every file. Uh, so if you downloaded a file, when you saved it back, it would say version two right next to it. So it, it's keeping a version of every time you're changing those files up and down uh, from BIM 360 site. So, so if there is a downside to using a tool like this, what is it? What is it that really causes the biggest problems, that causes the biggest consternation, that, you know? So th this is, <laughs> yeah, uh, fair enough. So. As most of you know, in, in File Explorer windows, you're used to being able to click and drag, moving things around relatively quickly. Uh, we've learned that you can't do that in BIM 360, in the document management. That is not a tool that they have available right now. You can't also upload whole folders at once or download whole folders at once. So if I'm issued a drawing package that's in three different folders and each folder has, you know, 20 subfolders and then those subfolders have a bunch of files in them, I have to individually create all of those folders and individually upload all of those files to those places. So that is a huge downside and we've communicated that to Autodesk and supposedly they've told us worst case scenario it's fixed by Q3 of this year. So it's, not, it's a downside right now, I don't see it as a long term uh, hindrance to project management. Uh, but that's one of the biggest things. Greg, you're waving Again, this comes more from in the weeds. I mean, I think the presentation was more on the platform of BIM 360 as opposed to where we're coming from, typically just from this old C4R collaboration tool that then became BIM 360 and now it's gone on to next gen. And so for us, what happens, and again, this is just data management, um, but when you do a, a, a model exchange every week or every two weeks, just via a Dropbox or a new form or whatever, you're, you, you Sometimes you get a little bit of a, a feel for what's been changed in the model. But now when the model is constantly linked in and you go in to start supporting X or framing around something and the architect is playing around with the model and they're removing a wall that you're using as support, so then you go change and put new supports in and then the wall shows back up next day. So it, you know, Revit has kind of changed that from the get-go in the sense that, oh, well, it's in the model you should be able to find it. You should be able to design around it. Instead of the old school updates on Fridays with a quick email saying, we moved this, we changed this. And now it's even gotten to the point where, you know, if you refresh the architectural link and they're moving a wall to see what it looks like, you know, and you happen to catch them at that time and there's no communication, it causes a, a lot of spinning around. I'm saying I think there is a feature where they can control when they want to publish the changes. They don't exactly have to like, it's not always live. It's not always like you always just refresh and you will see what I'm doing. No. So when I want to publish, then only you can see it. Yeah, so if somebody, if somebody wants to publish the change, they can say publish the change rather than seeing as, as, as you're working along. But some people don't follow methodologies and publish all the time, I guess. Is a, yeah, you can link it in live. Right. Go ahead. 
uh, it's kind of my my question is a piggyback on all that discussion right now. How is it really working? Um, I'm an old C4R, you know, work sharing live between offices, working great. Moving to the new next gen design, you, what I've experienced, you do have to publish. If those using design collaboration, see live linking, could, but there's that whole deeper workflow of publishing to consume to then use. I mean, what what's, I'm looking for what's the best workflow right now? Because to one, eliminate confusion, but also be informed quickly. I think it was mentioned earlier, the, the process is really from either a consultant or from a, an architect's point of view, you know, we're working in the model. That model is on the cloud. Um, I've got my team moving walls around, getting doors and all that stuff fixed. And maybe the uh, execution plan says you've got to publish that model on Fridays. So we publish it. And what you, what, that was what they were referring to. We've got a, a tick mark on that chart coming across. So where it said BR plus A, here's where they're posting their models. The concept is that when that model is posted, then the other consultants that need that model grab it and say, that's the model that I'm now looking at. So then instead of changes that um, Greg's watching me rearrange a toilet 15 times while he's trying to get the columns in the right spot, um, it's I can do my work and then say it's done and I'm published on Friday and then Greg sees it um, Saturday or Monday, probably Monday, and, um, uh, and then can, can go from there. So that, that, is, that is the process now um, that works. Is that similar to what you guys are doing? When we see someone's published something so we can get it in there, whether it be through the Navis viewing it um, on the appended file that we've posted or through a Revit background that we're then linking into our model so we can see that update. But it's definitely on a publish, you know, status. It's not a live. I guess it's, it's new to me too, so I'm, it, make sure we're not sor short circuiting and adding a step where we're publishing a weekly publish, but then Greg's a, already a week behind in his, his updates, right? right? Versus working live, which is a struggle because if he moves something working live that you're thinking is right but it's not right, so it's that sweet spot that I guess we're, everybody, we're all trying to find, right? Um, so hearing that publishing weekly is working and I guess that's where we start, but should you be fast earlier, like daily, nightly, every three days, weekly? Should it be twice a week, once a month? I mean, that's, we're still, we're still trying to figure it out. Well, I mean, that's, we try to establish that in our DPG execution plan right up front so that it's, it's a known, you know, date that you have to have that out, especially if we're having weekly coordination meetings. Uh, if you've got updates that you need to have in there, uh, it, that you want everybody else to see. I mean, you're going to want to have that published in there before that weekly meeting um, so you can get those tickets updated so you can make sure that you're not the one at the top of the board that's got the, the most open tickets. So, I mean, it's definitely a, a driver for the subs. I mean, they see that their name is, you know, on the top of that list with the most open tickets, and it's a good way to, hey, you, you know, we need you involved here. We need you to get into this coordination effort so that we're making sure the latest and greatest is published. So, I mean, if the rest of us aren't seeing it, so we can clear the tickets, then obviously there, you know, nobody else can see. All right. Any, anybody else have any any more questions? I got I got one last one. That I'm curious about. If we don't have any more questions, I, we, we're going to dismiss class early here tonight. But uh, my last question is: is in BIM 360, isn't there a tool that you can take to Revit files and compare them and see what's changed. Okay. Yeah, and, and I saw that tool and I was like, that's really cool, but does it get used? Uh, so, I mean, is, is there a use case for that? Am I, or am I missing? The intent is yes, to use that 
actually quite a bit, uh, especially for things like changes coming out on a rapid pace, uh, kind of like we were talking about, right? If we're designing every week and those changes are coming out every week, you know, we need to be able to know what's going on without having to go into and see every little detail. But what it'll do is it'll actually take those two models, compare them, give you a 3D view, and give you a red stuff that's deleted, green stuff that was added, and yellow stuff that was changed, moved, however. So it highlights that those specific objects in the model and actually highlights those things that changed or altered or were deleted. Easier in between the publishing and and to help evaluate those. That's what we would use as contractors to help evaluate those those changes. And soon to be make payments on too, right? Right. Who's done what work, right? <laughs> so anyway, all right. There any more questions? Got one back there. Go ahead. So is BIM 360 next gen supporting other formats of the model or not? Like not Nevit, uh, not Revit. No, that's that, that's Navis Works territory right now, <laughs> but but it'll, it'll it'll combine just about any, any Navis Works will do about any, you know, file format that you have for geometry that you can think of. Uh, but I don't think BIM. I, and I was I was talking with Jason earlier. I was like, well, shouldn't they just combine glue and Navis Works? I mean, and just get rid of the confusion, call it Navis glue or something. <laughs> I mean, they'll come up with some creative name, trust me. Yeah. Okay. He, he's right. Uh, Navis, works. Navis Works is still the best tool for that. Glue uh, is, is lacking that, that real function of combining those models uh, in a very simple state. Uh, so Navis Works really has that beat. So I think the biggest difference that we're all seeing when we're looking at this is we're trying to understand how it works with our workflow and how it, how it impacts us, right? Because we all have, every office does submittal review process slightly differently, but the goal is still the same. It's given to us. We review it, and we make our comments and send it back. So part of the question in terms of evaluating it is how much of a tolerance are you willing to take to reevaluate all of those steps and processes? Um, I know some folks, um, even within our office or our organization, would say, absolutely not. I'm doing it this way, and that's it. And there's other of us that are like, well, I know that process, and I know how it works, but let's see if I can find something that makes it much, much better um, or potentially quicker. Um, the flip side is, and I can understand HKS's point of view about time stamping, is there's that contract aspect that says, I've got certain things I have to meet at certain times, and if I don't know when I was supposed to do it and that sort of thing, making sure that those, those check marks are in place that, yes, I did take three weeks to review that submittal, and yes, you did give me that at the right time. Um, so those are a couple of other things that we have to think through as we're looking at all these really cool tools because what I'm seeing is that a lot of the stuff that we do uh, internally on a project is all getting pushed to the cloud and because of that now everybody else is starting to stick their finger in the pie at the same time and we're either trying to swat them away or say yeah you can yep you're part of the pool now too so I get that so something to think about all right great anything else no Dwayne yes, sir. who you designated to be the publisher of your models um, because anyone that has, or well, I guess if some permissions, you can publish from Revit each one. Who's, who's that gatekeeper? <laughs> so currently, because we have it set up to where it's the named model that's going into Glue, the two overwrite what we have then merged into our Navis model for coordination. Um, we're generally asking for the BIM managers of each one of our subcontractor group to be the one to do that. Um, but we, there's no way that we can enforce that. There's no way that we're going to know who's published that model with that name that's going to it unless we're going back through to Glue and looking at each individual one. So we're really going off of whatever the Navis model is showing is the latest published version of that subcontractor's model. So, I mean, it's really... 
we're not really concerned with who's doing it as long as it's the latest one and that's the one they want to have as their representation in these coordination meetings. I mean, I can answer the, the design side, and that would say that, for the most part, the model that we're publishing is what they're seeing on the cloud version. So pretty much anybody on my team can make the decision that, yes, they're going to publish it. Um, usually they're checking with each other because our teams are probably only three or four people. Um, but I don't have one gatekeeper that says, all right, everything's done, I can now publish. Um, Greg and I were just talking on the side, what happens if he needs me to move a wall so he can finish his coordination of the work. I may skip the process of submitting it on Friday and give it to him on Thursday and one on Friday. So at least he's got stuff to, to do. So it's not that I have to do it every Friday. I can do it pretty much every day if I needed to, um, to, to keep that workflow moving. So at, at, at that point, it opens up more communication. All right, any more questions? All right, well, thank you. Let me, I have one quote I asked before you, you, I, you, I, you all leave tonight. Thank you for coming out, taking your time, spending with us tonight. Uh, we're really trying to get our YouTube videos relevant on YouTube. So if you haven't done it already, could you, after the meeting, at some point, go to search CAD Microsystems, go to the, at least click on it, because what that'll do is that'll put us up in the relevancy ratings. So it gives us more, more, more traffic and attention. We're really trying to figure out if there's value to this. So if, if you would... Uh, had a spare moment, said CAD Microsystems, tonight's video, and go just click on it and you watch two seconds of it, that helps us. So, Dean? Kittens and puppies, right, 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 we're going to tell it kittens and puppies and Revit. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. We'll see you in two months, and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>